The Challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you huskies. <laughs> gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. It was shortly after the Northwest Mounted Posts had been established at the top of Chilkoot and White Pass that Sergeant Preston drove down from Dawson with a load of mail from the sourdoughs in the Klondike. His final destination was the port of Skagway, but he also carried dispatches for Major Ward, the military governor of the territory, who was making his temporary headquarters at the White Pass Customs Post. He found the Major in his office. Yes? I have dispatches from Inspector Conrad in Dawson, sir. Sergeant Preston, why, I didn't recognize you at first in those trail clothes. Welcome to White Pass. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. Thank you, sir. What kind of a trip did you have? Well, I made fairly good time. Trail wasn't broken below the Stewart River. We ran into a lot of ice jams in the 30 mile, but we made it in 16 days. Well, that's excellent. You were the first man to come out of the Klondike since the freeze up. Yes, sir. The mail was piling up in Dawson, and the inspector decided something should be done about it. Yeah. I'm carrying nearly a thousand pounds. My orders are to deliver it to the American post office in Skagway. And then what? Pick up the Dawson mail and head north. Your team will need a rest before you start back. Yes, sir. At least a week. That should be long enough. You know, Sergeant, your appearance gives me an idea. Why, uh, I have a uniform on the sled, sir. I can change into that before I head down into American territory. No, 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 no. I'd rather you didn't. That's part of the idea. You've noticed the stream of prospectors coming through customs? Yes, sir. For the first time with these new posts, we're in a position to check every person who comes through either Chilkoot or White Pass at the border. A great improvement over last year, sir. And a necessary one. This rush, this stampede, is growing every minute. And the best way to preserve law and order in the territory is to make sure that no criminal crosses the border. I agree. There are plenty of them in Skagway, from competence men to killers. And we only know a few of them by sight. We need more information about them. And I believe you're the man to get it for us. I'll do my best, sir. You look like a sourdough, a professional dog puncher. Such people are popular in Skagway now, men who know the territory well. Every door will be open to you. I suggest that you spend the next week in Skagway. If you want a list of the undesirables, it should be stopped at the border. Exactly. I'll get it for you, sir. Fine. And so it happened that Sergeant Preston was dressed in a fur cap and parka, caribou shirt, breeches, and mucklucks as he drove down the White Pass Trail to Skagway. On King! On you, Hutchie! The town was crowded with men from every walk of life and from every part of the world. Cowboys and clerks, lawyers, gamblers, merchants, thieves. There was no law, and the dregs of the San Francisco underworld preyed on the innocent. The sergeant found that the best place to observe these unsavory characters was in the notorious 303 Cafe. One afternoon, he was seated in a corner when he noticed a young Texan talking to one of the entertainers at the next table. The sergeant recognized the girl, a singer named Sally Lee, and he had met the young man the night before. It was impossible not to overhear their conversation. There are the two men I mentioned, Tex. Where? They're just coming in the door. Oh, will you ask him to come over here? Well, I'm not sure that I ought to. Why not? Well, they're friends in a way, but I've only known them for a few weeks. Now, don't you perhaps... worry about me, honey. When it comes to a business deal, I can take care of myself. I told you how much I got from my ranch. Yes, and you shouldn't have. Oh. <laughs> you mean I shouldn't trust you? Oh, no, but... Oh, what's the use, Tex? You just talk too much, that's all. <laughs> Go on, call them over. All right. But, Tex! Yeah, they heard you. They're coming. Mm -hmm. Hello, Sally. Hi. Hello, Bart. Kurt. 
This is Tex Corey. And Mr. Adams and Mr. Miller. Glad Howdy to know you. Hi. Sit down. Thank you. Miss Allie's told us about you, Tex. Says you're interested in buying a claim. That's right. Oh, well, I think I'll leave you. Uh, stick around, Sally. If you're going to talk business, uh, I... Stick around. All right. You have a lot more sense than most of these tender feet, Tex. Uh, how do you mean? Well, they won't take the word of sourdoughs like Kurt and me that most of the ground has been staked already. That the only thing to do is buy a claim. Oh, Ben Clark told me that. Give me a list of the cricks that I should look in it. Oh, uh, what would you say to a claim on the Bonanza? Oh. <laughs> I'd say I couldn't afford it. Claim like that would be worth a fortune. Well, uh, you have $20,000. Why, yeah, I do. Not in cash, but the great Northwest Company here will honor my draft for that money. Here, uh, take a look at this deed. Uh, what? Oh, Nancy. Number 47 above discovery. Mm -hmm. Would you pay 20000 for that? In a minute. Oh, I mean, I'd have to make sure this deed was authentic, of course. I... I just can't understand anyone letting Bonanza property go for so little. Oh, well, man, I don't want to cheat you. You could get 100000 for that claim. Yep, that used to be our prize, didn't it, Kurt? <laughs> Try and get it. No one in Skagway has that kind of money. Well, if you can't get it, why do you sell? Why don't you work the claim yourself? For two reasons, Tex. The country's too rough for Kurt. Now, I've got a family back in the States. They need me. I want to go home. We want to sell and get out of here. Well, I don't like to take advantage. And 20000 means more to us than 200 would a year from now. You wouldn't be taking advantage of us, Tex. Uh, it sure looks that way to me. Oh, you might not even get your money back. <laughs> from a claim on the Bonanza? Well, I'll admit that Charlie Trains washed out close to half a million from number 46, next door downstream. Still, there's no telling about gold. Hasn't the claim been proved? Well, we've worked it enough to hold it. How much did you get to pay him? About $100. It should be a good investment at $20,000. You honestly want to sell? As soon as we can. For cash tax. Oh, I can get my draft cashed. Well, then we could close the deal tonight. Sure. Okay, except for the business of checking the deed. I couldn't tell you if it were genuine or not. Oh? Just who are you? Oh, I know him. Hello, Bill. Hello, Tex. This is 40 Mile Bill. He just come down from the Klondike, and he knows the Bonanza from one end to the other. I'll take his word about the deed. Good enough, good enough. Here it is, Bill. All right. Do you happen to know the claim? Yes. They're telling the truth about it, Tex. It's only been worked a little. And the deed's okay? Yes, that's the gold commissioner's signature. I know it as well as I do my own. There's nothing wrong with the deed. Thanks, Bill. Not at all. Where will I bring the money, here? No, Tex, I, I wouldn't like anyone here to see me putting $20,000 in my pocket. Oh, sure. Uh, when are you through here, Sally? At midnight. Mm. How about Sally's cabin, Tex? Well, that'd suit me fine. Oh, sure, you're all welcome. Anytime after midnight. Good. It's all settled then. We'll be seeing you, Tex. You're sure you'll be able to get the cash? Or cash or gold. It doesn't matter, does it? No. Yep, we'll be seeing you. I have to change my dress, Tex. It's nearly time for me to sing. You don't think I'm making a mistake, do you, Sally? About the claim? No, Tex. You're not making any mistake. I'm glad to hear you say that. Now, I'd better get over the Great Northwestern office right away. Tex went to the Great Northwestern office and cashed a draft. They were able to give him the 20000 in large bills, and he returned to his cabin. After supper, he decided against going to the 303 with so much money on him and spent the evening reading. At 12 o'clock, he put on his parka, blew out the lamp, and stepped out into the dark street. <sighs> He had only taken half a dozen steps when a man stepped from the shadows behind him and brought a blackjack down on the side of his head. Oh. Tex dropped in his tracks. Got him, Joe. Good work. He must have the money in his inside pocket. Yeah. But the sergeant and King had been waiting across the street, and as Joe bent over the fallen Tex, the sergeant stepped in, pulled him upright, hey. and drove a solid left to his jaw. Oh. Joe staggered back, and the sergeant drew his gun. Now get out of here, both of you. The two men ran. Don't shoot. We're going. The sergeant knelt beside Tex. Oh, he isn't hurt badly, King. Uh, hey, what this happened? This is Bill, Tex. Uh, what happened? Someone hit you over the head. My, my money. It's safe. You better go back inside and lie down for a minute. No, I can't. I know all about your engagement. You can wait a little while. Go on. Uh, all right. Inside the cabin, the sergeant examined Tex's head and decided no serious harm had been done. You'll be all right. Just rest easy for a minute. Who was it that hit me? I don't know. There were two of them. 
Probably members of Soapy Tanner's gang. Lucky you were around, Bill. It wasn't accidental. I heard you tell Adams and Miller that you'd be at Sally's cabin tonight with $20,000. And if I heard you, there was no reason why other people couldn't. People who might not be so friendly. The 303 is filled with Soapy's men. Yeah, Sally told me I talked too much. She was right. You may have talked too much to her. Oh, now, wait a minute. I can't stand for that. How long have you known her? About a week. And you told her all about selling your ranch for $25,000 and that you had the money on deposit at the Great Northwestern. Bill, you don't understand how I feel about Sally. Of course I do. I'm not sure how she feels about you, though. Well, neither am I exactly. Tex, I'm not saying that Sally may not be perfectly all right, but a man has to be careful. There's absolutely no law enforcing agency in this town, not even a marshal. If your money had been stolen tonight, there'd have been no way in which you could have gotten it back. No one to turn to. I happen to have a gun of my own, Bill. I better carry it from now on. Not a bad idea. But you're not suggesting that... What? That Sally might have... No, I, I won't believe that. Sally might have what? Well, that she introduced me to Adams and Miller knowing I'd want to buy their claim. That it was all a trick to put me on the streets after dark with $20,000 in my pocket. There's one way to find out. Ah. Go to her cabin, see if they're waiting for you there. I intend to. It's a wonderful bargain, Bill, that claim for 20000 Yes, almost too wonderful. Well, you saw the deed. You said There's it... nothing wrong with the deed. What do you mean? Before you pay your money tax, make sure you get the same deed. Huh? There are confidence men as well as gunmen in this town, Tex. And one of their favorite tricks is to get some... In Sally's cabin, the girl was putting a pot of coffee on the stove while Kurt Miller played solitaire and Bart Adams paced the floor. Your friend is late. It's only a quarter past twelve. Uh, let's make sure you've got everything straight. Oh, how many times do we have to go over? Once more won't hurt. Now, uh, he's sitting at the table where Kurt is now. Mm-hmm. We're sitting on either side of him. I show him the deed, let him get a good look at it. Then I put it back in the envelope, place the envelope on the table with my left hand on top of it, and hold out my other hand for the money. As soon as I get the money in my pocket... I spill hot coffee on him. Mm, yes. well, what could be simpler? That isn't the tough part. All right. He jumps up, you and Bart get between him and the table, and I switch the envelopes. Um, where have you got the other envelope? In the pocket of my dress, underneath my apron. Here, I showed you where I was putting it. Yeah. Let's try the switch once. Here's the real deed. Now, go ahead, do it. Oh, dear. You've got to time it just right. All right, if you insist. Now, I'm standing behind him, so. Uh, spill the coffee, so. He jumps up, you jump up. I circle the table, so. Putting down the coffee pot. Now. I switch the envelopes. Not bad. That's okay. <laughs> I could do it in my sleep. Well, just be sure. Wait, here he is now. Hello, Tex. Howdy, Bart. Come in, come in. All right. Hi, Sally. Hello, Tex. Hi, Tex. Uh, get those cards out of the way, Kurt. Yeah. Here, sit down right here, Tex. Oh, thanks. We thought maybe you'd change your mind. Oh, I, I was just held up a little. You got the money, huh? Yeah, right here. Good, and I have the deed. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to take another look at it. Sure thing. Sure. It's all right? Yeah, seems to be. Mm, I'll just put it back in the envelope. It's yours as soon as you can count out the dough. Yeah, let's see. One thousand, two thousand. Tex counted out the twenty thousand. Sally watched him closely, and just as he was placing the last bill in Bart's hand, she picked up the coffee pot and walked toward the table. How about a little hot coffee, gentlemen? Uh Uh, Kurt, hand me those cups. Oh, 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 Tex, I spilled Uh, my hand. What's the matter with you anyway, Sally? That coffee must be scalding. Oh, I'm sorry, Tex. Your hands burned. Uh. You got any grease to put on it, Sally? Uh, yeah. Well, hurry. Well, oh, my hand's all right. It was just a... Here, this will make it feel better. It'll take the sting right out of it. There. Doesn't it? Sure. That's fine. Sally. Well, at least you didn't spill anything on the deed. You'd better put it away, Tex. I'll take that envelope if you don't mind. Bill, it's got a gun. Yes. Hand over that envelope, Adam. This doesn't belong to you. I said hand it over. Shall I take it? Why, Keep you... them covered while I take a look at this, Tex. Okay, Bill. Thanks, I warned you that if these two men weren't honest, they might try to switch deeds. Oh, is that... I was watching through the window as I said I would. I saw Sally spill coffee on you. I saw Adams and Miller get between you and the table. 
I couldn't see Sally on the other side of the table, but I had an idea that while you were thinking of your hands, she might... Sally, you, you didn't. No, she didn't. Very happy to say she didn't. This is the deed to number 47 on Bonanza. What? I must apologize to you, Sally, and to you two gentlemen. Well, that's Number the... 47, the Bonanza. Yes, and you're surprised. Sally, you, you double-crossed us. That's right, Bart, and there's nothing you can do about it. You sold a claim that's worth a fortune for $20,000. You won't get away with it. Go on, Tex, get out of town. Get up to Dawson as fast as you can and have the claim transferred to your name. I'm not going anywhere, Sally, till I find out what this is all about. I'll tell you, Tex. I'll tell them, too. I've been waiting for this moment. My name is Sally Lee Carter. You're... Does the name Carter mean anything to you, Bart? Carter. I see you remember. And so do you, too, Kurt. Six months ago, an old man, my father. The trick worked with him, didn't it? You took his last $10,000, and when he realized he'd been swindled and there was nothing he could do about it, he, he shot himself. But he wrote me a letter first, and he told me what you'd done to him and how you did it, how you murdered him. Sally. I swore that I'd get even then, Tex. I, I had no idea how, but I came up here. They were looking for a new girl to help them with their swindles. I qualified. I managed to persuade them there was nothing I wanted in this world but easy money. So they took me on. Tonight was my first and my last job, though. We can call it quits now. Oh, no, we can't. I want that deed back, Tex. Here's your money. You sold your claim, but it's gone. You've thrown away a fortune. We'll attend to you later. But I warn you, Tex, you'd better take your money and forget the whole business. Soapy Tanner's a friend of mine. If you try to get out of town with that deed, he'll put a hundred men on your trail. You'll never get to the top of the pass alive. Give me your gun, Tex. I'll keep them covered until you cross the border. No, you're coming with me. Good idea. I'll come, too, and Sally can ride my sled. You'll never get to the top of the pass alive. You, too, won't be calling on Soapy for help. We'll bind and gag you before we leave. Do you have any rope, Sally? No. Anything to tie them up? An old blanket. You could tear it up. All right, let's have it. Uh, all right. But as the sergeant bound and gagged the two men, Bart continued to threaten them. Even if you do get across the border, you won't be safe. There's 20 of Sophie's men who are going to force their way through Chilkoot Pass tonight. Oh, that's interesting news. I'll get word to them somehow. They'll catch you on the trail of Dawson. You won't be talking until you're found. That may be a long, long time. They'll... Bart was silenced as the sergeant stuffed a gag in his mouth. Already, Sally? Yes, Bill. Put out the lamp, Tex. Right. Yeah, I got it. Let's go. The sergeant and King, Tex and Sally, headed down the street in the direction of the sergeant's cabin. They had only gone half a block, however, when they heard voices behind them. They looked back. There were two men standing outside Sally's door. They began to pound on it. Oh, bad luck. That cuts down our time. We'll have to run. Come on, Sally. As they ran down the street, one of the men in front of Sally's cabin continued to pound on the door. The other looked in the window. It's dark. There's no one here. There must be. Sally, if nobody else. There's nobody on the cart. Well, where could they be? Sally and Bart and Kurt. They were supposed to meet Tex here. Yeah, we were supposed to get his cash as soon as he left his cabin. Hey, he probably didn't show up here. They've gone to his place. That's it. We'll go there. We'll wait for Bart and Kurt outside. Hey, wait a minute. I heard something. Somebody lying on the floor. It's Bart and Kurt. Come on. we got to force this door. At that moment, the sergeant was harnessing his team. Keep them quiet, King. Going to take King with me, Tex. Seems used to working without him, you won't have any trouble. Aren't you coming with us? It's time I told you who I am. You're a friend in need. That's all that matters to me. The well, name's oh. Preston. Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. In the Northwest Mounted? What are you doing in American territory? Checking on the undesirables we don't want in the Yukon. There are only two places they can cross the border. Yeah, White Pass and Chilkoot. That's right. Our main headquarters and most of our men are at White Pass. There are only two or three on duty at Chilkoot. If Soapy's men try to force their way through there tonight, there's a good chance they'll succeed. Once they're on the far side of the mountains, we'll have a hard time tracking them down. Now, here's what I want you to do. A break in the mountains called White Pass was almost directly above the town of Skagway to the east. Chilkoot was much farther to the north. It was the sergeant's idea that Tech should drive straight out of town and up the White Pass trail to the northwest mounted post at the top. In the meantime, the sergeant would be heading north through American territory to warn the men on duty at Chilkoot Pass and help them defend it. Tell the major we'll try to hold out until reinforcements arrive, but he'd better get them there fast. I'll tell him. Climb on board, Sally. Uh, thank you. Get going, Tex. Right, sergeant. Hush! Hush on! 
As Tex and Sally headed out of town, the sergeant and King returned to the main street. There was a crowd of men in front of the 303 and at least a dozen dog teams. In the light from the cafe, the sergeant caught a glimpse of Bart's face. He was talking to Sophie. But Tex and Sally were out of reach now. It was only the men at the top of Chilkoot who were in danger. Come on, King. The sergeant started to run with King at his side. They left the town behind. The trail to sheep camp at the bottom of Chilkoot Pass stretched ahead, hard packed and glistening under the northern lights. The coastal mountains, the boundary between American and Canadian territory, reared their snowy heights to the east. Only a man hardened by days of running behind a sled could have maintained the pace the sergeant set. At five o'clock, he reached sheep camp, and for the first time, he turned toward the mountains. At the foot of the ascent, he stopped for a moment. In the distance, south toward Skagway, he could hear dogs. They're coming, King. Up we go. <laughs> King and the sergeant started to climb. The trail twisted back and forth up the side of the mountain, steep, icy, and dangerous. It took the sergeant nearly half an hour to make the ascent. And now Soapy's men were at the foot of the mountain. But the customs house was nearly reached, and someone hailed the sergeant from the opening of the pass. Hello there. Hello. Hi, Sergeant Preston and King. What's left of us, Jim? I noticed you coming up the trail. What's the matter? What's the hurry? See those men down below? Yeah? They belong to Soapy Tanner's gang. They intend to force their way through the pass. Who's here with you? Harry Barnes. He's sleeping. He won't be for long. Do you have anything to build a barricade across the trail? Our sled, some packing cases, but can three of us... That looks like a small army. 20 or 25. I sent a message to the Major asking for reinforcements. We've got to hold them off until they get here. You wait, Harry. I'll start on the barricade. All right. Cross here where we'll have the best field of fire. Yeah. The three men, the sergeant and two constables, worked with frantic haste. By the time Sophie's men were nearing the top, the barricade was completed. When the gunmen saw it, they took to the cover of the boulders on either side of the trail and opened fire. The defenders of the pass fired back. After the first exchange, Sophie's men started working their way upward, moving from one point of cover to another. Well, there's no stopping them. There's open ground in front. They'll have to show themselves before they can reach us. Keep at it. Right. The gunfight continued without any let-up, and Sophie's men crawled closer and closer. The bullets ripped into the wooden barrier, and Barnes was hit. No. Constable Downey carried him back to the shack while the sergeant held the pass alone. <laughs> Downey returned with more ammunition, and the fight went on. One hour, two hours, and the guns were blistering hot before there was a lull. We've wounded half a dozen of them, Sergeant. You think they've had enough? No. What time is it? It's nearly 8 o'clock. It'll be light in another hour. They'll charge us before then. They may be getting ready for it now. What's the matter, King? Something behind us. Go see. It could be the reinforcements from White Pass. I sure hope so. The reinforcements had arrived, but there weren't many. The Major and half a dozen men. Enough to beat back any attack, perhaps, but not enough to take the offensive. The Major and the Sergeant held a council of war. It's too bad they didn't have more men available. Those crooks are in Canadian territory now. I'd like to move out and round them up. We could let them move in, sir. How do you mean? Take cover in the cabin and the customs house on either side of the trail. Yes. Let them break through this barrier and walk into a trap. Well, it could work. I think so, sir. I'll tell them in the cease fire. Cease fire, Down the slope, another conference was being held. Bart was urging an immediate attack. There were only three of them to start with. We know we got one of them, maybe two. Maybe. Bart's got something, Joe. There's only been fire from one spot during the last ten minutes. There isn't any firing now. All right, let's go. Come on, let's go get it. The men charged up the slope to the opening of the pass. Let's go. There were no shots from behind the barrier. They've either cleared out or they're dead. Come on. Now break it down. Hurry it up. The packing cases were tossed aside and the outlaws ran on into the pass. And then a sharp command rang out. Open fire! From the customs house, from the cabin, from the cover of rocks on either side of the trail, the members of the force opened fire. Half a dozen of the outlaws dropped to the ground wounded. Panic seized the others. Their first thought was of escape. The next instant, they realized it was impossible. To survive, they must surrender. They threw down their guns. In less than five minutes, the fight was over. The victory had been won. We'll leave the wounded here with Constable Downey and two others, Sergeant. You may assign them in. Yes, sir. We'll march the others back to jail at White Pass. I think this is the last time any of the Skagway hooligans will try to force a way into the Yukon. Round them up, Constable. 
Sergeant Preston will give the orders. Yes, sir. Three days later, while the sergeant was going over his report on the conditions in Skagway with a major, King rose from the floor beside his master and walked to the door of the office. Oh, want to go on, King? Just a second. But when the sergeant opened the door, he found Tex and Sally standing just outside. Well... Hello, Sergeant. Hello. Who is he? Tex and Sally, sir. Well, ask him to come in. We don't want to bother you if you're busy. Come in, come in. All right. You, uh, said something about a letter to the Gold Commission, Major. I uh, have it written, Tex. Here you are. Thank you. I'm sure there won't be any difficulty in establishing a clear title to your claim. Oh, it, it isn't exactly my claim. It certainly is. Uh, well, uh, what I mean is, well, after all, <laughs> Sally I, uh, and I... I think I know what he's trying to say, Major. Yes? I saw these two heading in the direction of the mission this morning. That's right. We've just come back. And now you're Mrs. Corey. Yes, Sergeant. Well, congratulations, my very best. And mine. <laughs> and King's. With Adams and Miller and 20 of Soapy's gunmen in jail, this is all we needed to make our report complete, sir. Huh? Major, I'm happy to say this case is closed. <laughs> In our next adventure, in a cabin on Keno Creek, Sergeant Preston is speaking to a miner. Joan, I'm hoping you can give me some information about what's going on here at Keno Creek. I, I don't know what you're talking about. You know well enough what I'm talking about. Blackjack Tully and his hired thugs are conducting a reign of terror among the miners. Listen, Sergeant, you, you don't realize what you're bucking up against. If I was to tell you anything against Blackjack Tully, my life wouldn't be worth a plug nickel. Neither would yours. Take my advice and clear out while you're still healthy. Yes, a reign of terror is going on among the miners on Keno Creek. But not a single miner dares to talk. Sergeant Preston will be facing one of his most difficult cases. And his own life may soon be at stake when he sets out to break the power of the king of Keno Creek. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure next Saturday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Saturday and Sunday. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until next Saturday. This program came from Detroit. Today's most popular heroes of outdoor adventure are heard every weekday afternoon from 5 to 6 o'clock. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Mark Trail roams the wilderness. Clyde Beatty defies the beasts of the jungle. And Victor Borga entertains with five minutes of musical laughs. Tuesday and Thursday, there are the Indian hero Straight Arrow riding to uphold justice, Sky King zooming to supersonic action, and Bobby Benson, the cowboy kid, in tales of western daring. Listen to Mutual's Hour for Fun with Mark Trail, Clyde Beatty, Victor Borga, Straight Arrow, Sky King, and Bobby Benson over most of these...